Okay, so we can perhaps start. Uh, I guess there will be other people joining, but first of all, uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, guests, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. We had, we hope you had a, a great weekend and uh, that you somehow still remember your well deserved uh, summer break. Uh, I'm Dominique Burgeon, I'm the director of the FAO liaison office with the UN in Geneva, and I would like to welcome you all to our FAO uh, Geneva Agriculture Trade Talks session. Uh, let me first, of course, thank you all for taking your time uh, to attend our meeting today, uh, given, of course, the always very busy um, time here in, uh, in Geneva and your busy agenda. Uh, before we start, just I would like to give the usual couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, please free. Please feel free to drop any question you may have in the chat box or raise your hands. As always, the presentation uh, will be uh, made available to you and will be shared so that you can uh, you can keep it. Uh, as you know, FAO, uh, in the context of our trade related work, support members effective engagement in the formulation of trade agreements that are conducive to improved food security by strengthening evidence on the implications of change in trade policies, providing capacity development in the use of this evidence and facilitating uh, neutral dialogue. In the spirit, this is in the spirit that uh, my predecessors uh, started back in 2018, a dialogue series entitled FAO Geneva Agricultural uh, Trade Talks uh, that are based on a sort of three I approach, informal, meaning exchanging information, ideas, and views without any attribution and reporting, interactive, providing a neutral platform for dialogue and engagement among stakeholders, and then inspirational, sharing knowledge and ideas uh, for use in policy and even negotiations if deemed useful. Uh, today, in our uh, agricultural uh, trade uh, session, we will focus on the latest uh, development on the impact of COVID-19 on agriculture and trade. And we are very happy to have with us uh, Maximo Torero, Maximo Torero Kulen, Kulen the FAO chief economist, uh, will be uh, briefing. But before giving the floor to, to Maximo, I'd like to to use this opportunity to also set the scene and say a few words about uh, FAO works, FAO's response to COVID uh, crisis. And there it is, it is clear that, uh, of course, the pandemic caught the world by surprise and put response system to a test. Even though we have been working on emergency preparedness for decades, one can still not fully anticipate how to react to their diversity and in, including such as the one we've been facing. The COVID-19 pandemic jeopardized, as you know, human health and disrupted the food systems that are, of course, the foundations of health. Critical measures initiated to control virus outbreaks uh, that have been taken, that needed to be taken by country had some unintended consequences on the uh, global uh, supply chains. And of course, this is what we have been keen to, uh, to very much understand. Uh, it was clear also to us at FAO from the very beginning that it was critical to take immediate action towards avoiding a global food emergency that could have long-term impacts on hundreds of millions of children and adults. And in that context, right from March, 2020, uh, FAO participated in the humanitarian response, uh, working to save the livelihoods of millions uh, among those uh, most food insecure, and in the meantime, developed a COVID-19 response and recovery program aimed at providing an agile and coordinated global response uh, to ensure nutritious food for all, both during and after the pandemic. FAO's program to address the COVID-19 pandemic is designed to address the social economic impact and mitigate the immediate effect of the pandemic while strengthening the long-term resilience of food systems and livelihoods. FAO has therefore been working, has been conceiving and implementing uh, a seven-pillar uh, program 
The first one working on the global humanitarian response plan. In that context, working, of course, with the, the OCHA and others, we have been assisting about 24 million people and working on, uh, in terms of risk uh, communication for another 11 million people. Second pillar has been very central and Maximo, uh, as well as on the other, has played a, a critical role on that one, is the data for decision making. Of course, this is uh, always be basically ensuring the availability of quality data analysis for effective policy support and decision making. A third one has been an, on economic inclusion and social protection to reduce uh, poverty, uh, basically to mitigate the negative impact of the pandemic and promote inclusive post-pandemic economic recovery. Uh, uh, we have been working on strengthening the sustainable economic inclusion of small scale producer, strengthening rural women economic empowerment and protect uh, rural employment. A fourth pillar has been under the, on trade and food safety standards. Uh, a fourth, and we will zoom in on that one today. Uh, a fifth one has been on boosting uh, small order resilience for recovery with a focus on essentially food crisis context. There has been a sixth pillar on preventing the next zoonotic, where we have been looking at how to uh, strengthen and extend the, the One Health approach to avert animal origin pandemics. And then a seventh one on, on comprehensive food system uh, transformation. But today, as I was saying, we will essentially focus on pillar four, uh, which I would like to recall is on, the, on trade uh, issues. And uh, it is clear that Maximo has a lot to share. So I know that you came to basically listen to uh, our chief economic, uh, Maximo Torero. And I would like, therefore, to, uh, without further any further delay, uh, give him the floor so that he can share uh, the, the understanding we have gained on the on the situation and share also the the most late the, the latest development uh, in that context. So, Maximo, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dominique. If you can stop sharing the screen so I can share my screen, that would be good. perfect. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues and excellencies, for for being here. It's a pleasure for us to do a, a, an update on, on the work that we are doing in the case of, of the impact of COVID-19 on the pandemic of agriculture trade. Uh, so the presentation uh, I am going to, to do today uh, will focus on, on five areas. Uh, I will be covering COVID-19 containment measures and policy responses in the agri-food sector. And that's central because the way countries are putting containment measures have a perfect correlate with the negative growth of GDP, and that's what has been impacting also issues of, of recession and, of course, consequences in terms of access to healthy foods and access to, to food and increasing undernourishment. The second part will be on the impacts on the agri-food markets and trade. Then I'm going to look into the divergent recovery paths and implications for food security, FAO's role on markets and trade, uh, and the lessons learned, what, what we can learn from these medium-term risk and policy implications uh, for the future so that we can uh, keep improving over time on how we act and react to these type of situations, as Dominique was mentioned. So let me first start with this diagram, uh, which is basically trying to show the, the evolution uh, of how to reduce and mitigate the speed of COVID-19. Governments around the world adopted various containment measures, including closures of business activities, confinements, curfews, quarantines, and travel restrictions within and across borders. The figure shows the stringence of COVID-19 containment measures since the beginning of the pandemic up to today. So it's just to give you an idea of the dynamics. Uh, and the first lockdown was imposed following the COVID-19 outbreak in the city of Wuhan and other cities in China on the 23rd of January 2020. By the end of March, beginning of April 2020, and most countries in the world had already implemented various forms of virus containment policies. Around May and June 2020, many governments started easing in the restrictions and economic activity at least partially resumed. Since then, the stringency of the measures has depended upon the intensity of the success of the waves of infections, which have different country and since beginning of 2021, also based on the extent of vaccinations. And what I was trying to explain is that as we increase the containment measures, in the bottom you will see a decline in GDP growth because of course you restrict economic activities. 
one of the major topics that we raised during this period of time was the importance of having the food value chains alive, the agri-food system alive, because there is no health without food. So it was important not only to do the containment measures, but to assure that the agricultural sector was a priority sector. And of course, trade is behind this. It's essential to, to the part of the agricultural sector in the world. Now, coming to policy responses in the agri-food system sector, concerns over food security and food safety worldwide at the beginning of the pandemic led countries to implement policy measures to curb potentially adverse impacts on the agricultural markets. And this including trade restrictions, measures to lower import barriers, and domestic measures. Among the trade measures, overall, only a very limited number of countries imposed restrictions on exports of agricultural products, and most of these were quickly repeated. And if we repealed, and if we compare these to the 207, 208, the number was significantly smaller, but not only that, the quantity of the commodity being exported affected was very small. And that was able later on through better communication and information through the agricultural market information system and through joint statements, we were able to work with countries so that, that the, even that didn't happen, which create a good situation for, for the delivery of food across the world. Import restrictions mainly include sanitary and phytosanitary measures on the specific products as live animals was imposed at the beginning. And this was because of some of the fears about the potential transmission through meat which later on were cleared and therefore that was a stop. On the contrary, several countries lower import barriers and that's more by suspending import tariffs or raising tariff rate quotas so that people could import cheaper food to their countries given the situation. And some countries also relax technical barriers to trade to facilitate imports of critical food items. Most of those measures were temporary and lasted at most until the end of 2020. At the same time, countries adopted domestic measures, and those are really important. This included producer support measures to ensure the continuation of agricultural production. Some countries also provide logistics and marketing support to overcome supply chains bottlenecks. To ensure domestic food availability, several countries increased domestic food procurement targets and or increased imports to build national reserves. And some countries implemented ceiling prices or expanded food distribution programs to improve access and affordability of food. Of course, many of these policies could create some inefficiencies, but as long as they are short term and in a transition process to move out once the situation stabilizes, is, is, is useful because it helps to aminorate the potential consequences in terms of cost that consumers will have as a result of, of this, this problem that we're facing COVID-19. Now, the international community play an important role in limiting the use of trade restrictions measuring during the pandemic. And that's what I was mentioning before. The policy commitments and coordination play a crucial role. So during this crisis, many countries in different settings from G20 to the African Union, from Asia to APEC, issued ministerial declarations and commitments. And heads of international organizations, including FAO, issued joint statements that aim at keeping agricultural supply chains alive. We came with this enormous message since the beginning, uh, early at the beginning of the, of, the, of the pandemic, especially in early March, about the importance of keeping the value chains alive together with resolving the problem of health. At the same time, the improving market transparency again show us how important this is and how good was the idea to create the AMIS uh, as a result of the G20 of Paris. And the availability of up-to-date data and information was seen as a crucial, particularly in the periods of crisis when pandemic restrictions could create reactions that aggravate trade, dis trade disruptions. In this regard, initiatives such as the Agricultural Market Information System, AMIS, as I mentioned before, and FAO Global Information and Early Warning Systems, the views play a crucial role during the pandemic by providing timely and valuable data and information on global food markets. F finally, trade facilitation measures were expedited during this pandemic. Many countries have started to streaming, streamlining their trade-related procedures, for instance, with respect to sanitary and phytosanitary measures. This included, for example, acceptance of the electronic certificates. Therefore, the crisis, this crisis could also be an opportunity to, off, to further boost digital solutions supporting the digital transformation of agriculture. So what, one core message here is the crucial role of information and transparency in the markets. And we believe that we were ready for that. There were some limitations. There was not too much detailed information on logistical issues, for example. At the beginning of the pandemic, there were several logistical issues because of closure of ports, because of lack of immobility of vessels, and later on, because of incapacity of chaff chiffling or changing the vessel crews after a six month period in the sea, which is the limit that they have. But now we are also ready for that. We have learned about that. 
and we have find a ways in which we can have real time information, and that will also help to improve the capacity that EMIS will have in terms of sharing information. Because once we know where are the restrictions, we can work with countries to release those restrictions, and for example, to reopen ports, which was central. But as I mentioned at the end, the importance of the digital technologies and the digital solutions, like the eFITO that was absorbed by Argentina and Chile in their custom procedures, opens an opportunity from where we can learn to be able to expand these type of measures that will help to facilitate trade. And one important topic also that, that gave another opportunity was that the pandemic allowed us to understand the importance also not only of global trade, but also intra-regional trade. And how it's important for certain regions like Africa, the, the seeds, the Caribbean, for example, and Latin America, and Asia to increase and accelerate the process of intra-regional trade because that will diversify their capacity to supply the food that they need to be able to respond to this type of shocks. So basically will increase the resilience in the way they can procure food, especially for import dependent countries. Next, I am going to, to discuss the impacts of COVID-19 related to shocks, including government containment measures and policy responses on the agri food trade and markets from the beginning of the pandemic to the present. So let me, let me first say that while curbing the circulation of the virus and lowering the pressure on health systems globally, containment measures also had disruptive effects on the entire food value chain. And the effects were not only on the supply side, but especially on the demand side. On the supply side, restrictions on movement of people and people failing ill led to shortages in labor, in agriculture processing and distribution. Disruptions in logistics, in supply chains and trade emerged throughout the world. These effects also exacerbated already existing crisis in the locus crisis in East Africa. Now, why is this so important? Because as you well know, the export market is highly concentrated, especially in the staple commodities. So we need to put emphasis on understanding those key exporting countries and those key importing countries, how they were evolving in terms of the logistical issues at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's where we have to focus with real-time information because it helped us to alert governments and to try to release those constraints so that there was no scarcity of food at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's a lesson learned that we are growing and improving, as I mentioned before. But the, the effect that is going to go longer and is not only staying, was not only at the beginning, like the logistical issues, is the demand side effects. And the demand side effects led to changes in consumption patterns. In its July 2021 World Economic Outlook update, the International Monetary Fund estimated that the contraction of the global economic growth in 2020 is minus 3.2%. And this is exactly the consequence I was mentioning. You restrict mobility, you restrict capacity to move goods, then you have a negative effect over your GDP growth. And there is a lot that we can learn now, especially if we are moving to more other waves as what we are observing today. How we can keep key sectors of the economy moving while keeping the, the health protocol so that the economy is not affected. Because the end of this is that this will increase unemployment and an overall reduction in income, resulting in reduction of purchasing power, which may cause a consumption in, in consumption. And that's what we observed. We had, because of COVID-19, and an increase in up to 161 million people moving more into undernourishment in 2020, which is a huge shock, compared also to 130 or more people, million people moving into extreme poverty. So consumption patterns also changed due to the closure of restaurants, more consumption at home, and increasing commerce deliverables. But also the cost of the diets change. And as a result of that, that will affect and people will be moving to lower quality diets. And those are the issues that we need to look at at the, at the demand side. So the COVID-19 pandemic and the measures taken to contain it have therefore triggered questions about the resilience of the global food system to such supply and demand shocks. And that's where the more we can learn, the better we can increase this resilience in the future. Now, examining the impacts on trade, it is useful to distinguish between the early part of the pandemic when market uncertainty was highest to the current period and the long-term trajectory. In the left figure, we see that during the first wave of the pandemic, world import values declined considerably in April and May of 2020, when the first lockdowns were imposed worldwide. However, by mid-2020, import volumes recovered very quickly, and also the number of trade flows quickly recovered around to the pre-pandemic levels. If we look at the right figure, agricultural trade in various products groups was affected differently during this crisis. For example, imports of staples, such as cereals, but also products considered to be important for a healthy diet, such as fruits and vegetables, were relatively less affected. Imports of other product groups, however, declined significantly. 
Trading live animals was affected in the area due to the import restrictions imposed by many countries, especially on live animals coming from highly affected regions. Fish trade was mainly affected through changes in demand caused, for instance, by the worldwide closure of restaurants. And with more social life coming to a halt, all the trade in cut flowers declined significantly throughout the period of, lock of lockdowns. And this brings also one major consequence, which was the increase in transportation costs. In the case of flowers, which is a stream that normally they travel through airplanes, they share the cost with the, with the passengers that travel for tourism and for business. When those flights were canceled or stopped, that created a huge problem. But when they even they were reopened as of today, the level of flow is a lot lower and therefore the costs are so high right now. Another consequence of cost is still we are feeling it in terms of the vessels transportation. And it's not only because of vessel mobility, but today is because of the recovery of some developed countries, which is demanding more containers, for example, which is putting pressure on the containers, which is also increasing the cost of transportation. Together, of course, with the current increase in oil prices that we are observing, because as the economies try to recover, the oil prices will have more pressure because of more consumption of energy, and that will affect what we consume today. Now, despite the short-term disruptions, agri-food systems, in fact, proved to be more resilient than other sectors of the economy. And this is central in the case of agriculture. Overall, between 2019 and 2020, agricultural exports rose by $51.8 billion, with expansion in exports by developing countries contributing to 40% of the global increase. While there was significant contraction in agricultural exports during the first half of 2020, as I mentioned before, there was a rapidly recovery in the second half of the year. Agricultural imports also rose by 47.2 billion with developing countries accounting for 83% of this increase. So for 2021, agricultural trade is expected to continue expanding and depending on the pace of the economic recovery, demand for commodities that are more income elastic, example, fishers and beverages is expected to rebound. And that will be of course related on how the transportation costs also lower. Importantly, the COVID-19 shock has not resulted in any significant change to the long run trajectory in agricultural imports, which has already slowed since 2011. Prior to 2011, including the periods from 20, 2000, from 2000, 2011, and 2005, 2011, growth in the value of agricultural trade has reached double digit rates, while volumes grew at a more moderate pace. Since 2011, there has been a near cessation of growth in the value of agricultural imports, and while there was a growth in import volumes, this was smaller than the previous period. So it's really important to understand this and that we need to reactivate even more the work we are doing in terms of increasing and accelerating the rate of growth of agricultural trade, especially focusing on inter-regional trade. Now, turning to the market situation for the specific commodities. Lower markets for cereals remain well supplied during the first part of 2020. And despite some downward revisions in production and forecasts in recent months, market prospects continue to remain favorable. That's why we were always saying that food availability was there. The problem was of food access. And for instance, cereal production utilization trade are all estimated to have been higher in 2019 to 2020 than in the previous years. Cereal production is expected to grow by 0.7% in 2021. And while the stock to use ratio for cereals in 2021, 2022, it stands at 28.1%, which is down from 29% in 2020 to 2021. This is still a relatively comfortable supply level from a historical perspective, which means that we have enough stocks that we can stabilize any potential shock. Commodities, oil and cereals have been more affected by the pandemic. Oil crops, sugar, meat, dairy and fishery products have all been affected by declining or stagnating demand. Meat and fishery sectors were also affected by disruptions of production processes and restrictions on the movements of workers and fishing crews. However, global economic recovery is expected to improve demand for some sectors, example, fisheries and dairy products, while meat trade is expected to stagnate and production of sugar is expected to decline for the third consecutive year. Reflecting this supply and demand dynamics, food prices for several commodities have risen significantly relative to the pre-pandemic levels. Between January and May 2020, there was a drop in the food, FAO food price index, possibly related to the onset of the pandemic. But between May 2020 and May 2021, that is since the end of the first wave of the pandemic, and largely in parallel with a weakening of the US dollar, 
the food price, the FAO food price index registered consecutive increases for 12 months. And remember here, there are two effects, the exchange rate effect, but also the effect of bigger demand, which have put some pressure in cereals and some reductions on supply because of climate issues. In the last three months, the food price index declined for two consecutive months in June and July 2021, but rebounded in August, led by strong gains in sugar vegetable oils and cereal subindices. Among the subindices of the, food, of the FAO food price index, the prices indices of the sugar and vegetable oils declined rapidly in the beginning of 2020 and recovered strongly in the second half of the year. Raising food prices are among the medium run risks that can undermine the efforts to improve the food security situation in the context. So it's important to understand what are the causes behind this and what we can do to be able to minimize those risks in the future. And essentially what we observe is a result of this significant demand of big importing countries, but also a result that is still the supply side, the, the, the trade surpluses that are being traded and the key exporting countries are still not as many as we would have wished. And therefore we are not as resilient to shocks of weather in a specific countries where our key producers and we need to find ways to keep increasing the supply side distribution across the world. Now, let me turn to the forecast for economic recovery and the implications of food security as a consequence of what we are observing. The latest edition of the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, the SOFI, was launched in July this year and highlights some worrying trends that we need to look at. With less than a decade to 2030, the world is not on track to ending world hunger and malnutrition. And in the case of the world hunger, we are moving in the wrong direction. World hunger increased in 2020 under the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic. And after remaining virtually unchanged for five years, the prevalence of undernourishment increased from 8.4 to 9.9% in just one year, highlighting the challenge of achieving the zero hunger target by 2030. It is projected that between 720 and 811 million, and it's the first time we put a projection because there is still uncertainty, people will be moving into face hunger in 2020. Considering the middle of the projection range, 768 million, and around 118 million more people were facing hunger in 2020 than in 2019. If we go to the upper limit, we're talking of 161 million people more that will go into undernourishment, chronic undernourishment with respect to 2019. The economic slowdowns and downturns primarily impacts food systems through the negative effects on people access to food, as I have been saying, including the affordability of healthy diets as they lead to rises in employment and declines in wages and incomes. As the economic and other impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic continue to unfold, the trajectory over the next years is difficult to forecast. However, it is clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has likely impacted the prevalence of multiple forms of malnutrition and could have lasting effects beyond 2020 as we already are seeing in 2021. The latest academic studies looking at the projections in all the different dimensions of malnutrition show that we will be significantly deteriorating as a result of this. So divergent recovery paths can create wider income gaps across countries. And here is where the problem of inequalities arise. Lower incomes result in reduction of purchasing power affecting access to food, particularly affecting the affordability of healthy diets. And this has significant repercussions of food insecurity in the world. And what we have seen in COVID-19 is that the recession and the shock and the incapacity of the poorest countries to be able to do the mechanisms and implementation to create a recovery like developed countries has exacerbated the differences and inequalities. And this is even seen within countries and within regions. The latest edition of the IMF World Economic Outlook, released in July 2021, points to a growing divergence in economic recovery paths for developing versus developing countries. The issue I was mentioned in terms of inequality. IMF forecasts that the global economic growth in 2021 at 6% and changed from the April 2021 forecast and 4.9% in 2022, up 0.5% from the April 2021. Although it's still uncertainty, as all of you know, depending on how things evolve on COVID-19, and what we are observing with expansion of Delta in the US and other regions being affected, this forecast could be affected and revised later. However, underlying this forecast, there is a widening gap between the advanced economies and many emerging markets and developing countries. For instance, while the IMF estimates the pandemic to have reduced per capita income in advanced economies by 2.8% per year between 2020 and 2022, relative to pre-pandemic years, the per capita income loss for emerging markets and developing economies 
excluding China, is 6.3%, close to three times more. Among the main reasons for these divergent trends are differences in pandemic development around the world. Close to 40% of the population in developed population in advanced economies has been fully vaccinated compared to 11% in emerging market economies and only 1.2% in developing countries. Another driver of the deepening divide is the divergences in policy support. There are countries to be substantial fiscal support in advanced economies, continues to be this, and there is 4.6 trillion in an announced support. And our revisions for the global 2022 growth forecast reflect anticipated additional fiscal support in the US and the EU. On the other hand, most measures in emerging markets and low-income developing countries expire in 2020. The G20 has done an effort through the consolidation and uh, avoiding the, the repayment of the debts in, in 2020. But again, the SDRs is another alternative that has been approved by the Board of the IMF, but still the magnitudes are completely different between what is happening in advanced economies and what is happening in developing economies. And we also must understand that economies in the world are internally. So what a developed economy does to reactivate their economy has a consequent and effects over developing countries. Like for example, more pressure over the demand of food commodities, more pressure over the demand of energy, and that of course has a correlate on prices, which will affect more the import dependent countries. So crucially, these economic slowdowns and downturns add into existing pressures and vulnerabilities in our food systems due to major drivers such as conflict, climate, variability and extremes. These are major drivers are increasingly occurring simultaneously in countries with interactions that seriously undermine food security and nutrition in the world. The pace of economic recovery also has implications for food imports. Changes in food imports this reflect the diverging responsiveness of import demand to changes in income, and these differ across countries and commodities. The provisional forecast for the World Food Import Bill in 2021 points to a record level of US dollars 1.715 trillion, that is an increase in 12% from 2020. Higher import bills are the result of a strong upturn in the GDP growth, as well as a higher unit cost reflecting both higher international prices and increasing freight rates, as I mentioned before. However, it must be emphasized that these trends are not uniform across the regions and commodities. Developed regions are expected to import less food in 2020 compared to 2020, 2021 compared to 2020, but a greater cost, higher prices and freight will be incorporated into that. That's why the values are high. By contrast, developing countries are expected to purchase more food in all food categories. This particularly driven by raising demand from cereals, vegetable oils, oil seeds and fruits and vegetable imports, with volumes accounting to for 60% of the predicted increase in their import bids. However, there is a high vulnerability in some countries where growing food import bills are dominated by increases in the unit cost of importing food. Example, in these developed countries are expected to purchase similar volumes of food in 2021 compared to 2020, but at a higher cost. In low-income countries, food deficit countries, total volumes of imported food are predicted to register a significant deficit, even though food import bills are expected to be high. This also implies that in these countries, the COVID pandemic could be contributing to a shift in demand from high to low value products and likely to deterioration of the quality of diets. And of course, to the consequences of overnutrition and the non-communicable diseases that this brings as a consequence. In many of these countries, food import bills are barely covered by foreign exchange earnings from merchandise exports. In normal times, services exports such as tourism are able to compensate for low produce proceeds from merchandise exports. But this is not the case during the COVID-19, leaving countries like Cabo Verde, Maldives, and Sao Tome and Principe particularly exposed. Seeds are one of the countries that has been the mostly exposed because the tourism goes down significantly, remittances goes down, and they are net food importing countries. So they are really vulnerable to this. And many African countries also has been exposed because of reduction in tourism remittances, but also because of the effect of international prices and the potential effects of the recession. Now, let me talk about FAO's role and the work activities in the area of markets and trade and what we are trying to do in this process. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted a key role played by FAO in markets and trade. For instance, FAO led advocacy efforts to help keep food supply chains alive, as I initially mentioned, and prevent ad hoc trade restriction measures. Very early in the pandemic, 
file in the effort to have a joint statement from the Director General of the FAO, WTO, and WHO. The FAO DG also made similar statements at the G20 Agricultural Ministers meeting, as well as the World Economic Forum, as well as in many other ministerial meetings, often convening by the FAO with the African Union, with several ministers. Of course, underlying this advocacy, of course, underlying this advocacy efforts is a solid market intelligence service. And that's where AMIS, the Agricultural Market Information System, play a crucial role to reduce market uncertainty and promote policy coordination. And views also the early warning system, as I mentioned before, help for this. This was complemented by country and region-based consultative mechanisms. We operationalize and activate all our regional offices. We track all the policies being put in place. We document this through a series of briefs that we put in our webpage to keep countries informed of the actions that countries were making, and also to keep them informed of the availability of food that was there, and also to keep them informed of the evolution of real-time prices. There was a new tool that FAO launched to be able to give countries real-time information of what was going on in their own markets. But at the same time, we were able to launch the information on logistical issues, especially on the mobility of vessels, which was of crucial importance to bring information to countries and to work with them to help solve these problems. Finally, a host of technical notes and policy briefs were prepared, which offer evidence-based policy advice and form the basis of all our sub substantive dissemination efforts. The immediate and ongoing response was complemented by a concerted effort through the COVID-19 response and recovery program that Dominique mentioned before. This program consisted of seven thematic areas, one of which is on trade and food safety standards. Compared to some other priority areas of the program, such as the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, the trade priority area has a medium-term objective of facilitating and accelerating food and agricultural trade during COVID-19 and beyond. It aims for a sustained recovery path, focusing on the following results. First, strengthen information, systems and enhance market transparency. Second, improve evidence-based decision-making and policy coordination at national and regional levels. Third, to enhance regional cooperation to promote use of science-based standards and mutual recognition and harmonization of food safety systems. Fourth, to foster adoption of trade facilitation practices, improving efficiency, transparency in the application of SPS and administrative measures. This is the same policy advice that we have been providing to countries as also mentioned in my last slide. Our objective through this program is to support countries in putting into action these policy priorities. And FAO can play a crucial role in this. Looking to the future, FAO support on markets and trade will be informed by how it is discussed in the Food Systems Summit. And its implementation will be guided by FAO in a strategic framework. And we will play a crucial role in the follow-up after the summit. On the Food Systems Summit, it's important to mention that in the run-up to the summit process and at the pre-summit, the significance of trade for sustainable food systems was recognized and it was included within Action Track 5 on building resilience to vulnerability to shocks and stress. Some of the proposed game-changing solutions focus on reducing disruptions to trade through greater transparency, unlocking the potential of trade through trade facilitation, and reorienting policies to targeting production, resilience, and sustainability. On our new strategic framework, FAO has a new strategic framework which consists of four aspirations, what we call the four betters. Better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. Its accountability framework has been aligned to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, incorporating SDGs, targets, and indicators, and guided particularly by SDG 1, poverty reduction, 2, hunger, zero hunger, and 10, reduction of inequality. In this framework, there is a dedicated program priority area, what we call a PPA, on transparent markets and trade, which fits within the better nutrition aspiration, because it's all are interlinked, and we want the PPA to focus on how we can increase access to healthy diets. Key thematic components of this trade PPA include establishing market intelligence and early warning systems at country regional levels to collect, analyze, and disseminate market and trade data and information. Assisting countries in developing human capital and institutional capacities for formulating, negotiating, and implementing multilateral and regional trade agreements. Support innovative policy and technical approaches and novel business models promoting and facilitating the integration of small scale actors, farmers, but also fishermen and forest SMEs into the markets and value chains. 
strengthen a multi-stakeholder re regional networks to advance regulatory cooperation on trade facilitation measures, including on sanitary and phytosanitary related issues. And finally, to promote the adoption of information and communication technologies, ICTs, and digital solutions to simplify trade processes, facilitate market integration, and increase the potential for consumers and the small scale actors to reap benefits from trade. We are leading the International Platform for Digital Food and Agriculture, which will also bring with all our partners and the stakeholders and members the best practices from where we can learn to accelerate this process. The role of markets and trade is therefore strongly recognized for food system transformation, as well as achieving FAO own aspirations. And this will imply strengthening support by FAO in this area, looking at supporting member countries to create a transformation that is needed. The last part of my presentation is about the lessons learned the risk and the policy implications. The pandemic has already highlighted several lessons and also exposed many risks as highlighted on this slide. Among the lessons learned that you can observe in the left side in the blue color, market fundamentals were different compared to previous crises. For instance, compared to 2007 to 8 for crisis, the global stocks to use ratio for most commodities was substantially higher, which allowed us to be better prepared for this crisis and food production prospects were positive at the beginning of 2020. Trade restrictions. Some countries impose export restrictions to ensure sufficient domestic supplies, but these were soon transformed into export quotas and ultimately lifted. Import restrictions mainly targeted live animals and fish. Most trade restrictions measures tend to be shortly. And again, it show the role and the importance of the information system that we got in place, but also allow us to understand where we still have gaps, like in the logistical part and how to improve on them. Trade facilitation practices. Because of social distances, quarantine, and travel restrictions, many countries decided to streamline the trade related procedures, including increase of use of digital solutions. Example, the, accept the acceptance of electronic SPS certificates, as well as establishing green corridors for expedited release of essential goods. Joint ministerial declarations. Many countries in different settings from the G20 to the African Union, from Asia to APEC, issue ministerial declarations and commitments aimed at maintaining agricultural supply chains alive. Heads of international organizations also issue joint statements urging countries to avoid using export restrictions measures and to ensure that trade in food and agricultural products continue to be flow smoothly. Market transfer in what central? Availability of up-to-date data and information is imperative, and we need to keep investing on this. It has a huge value, particularly in periods of crisis when panic-driven reactions can aggravate trade disruptions. Market information systems, such as the Agricultural Market Information System, the AMIS, an interagency platform launched by the G20 in 2011 and housed at FAO, were extensively used to enhance food market transparency and promote the coordination of policy actions in times of market uncertainty. This is a great best practice that we need to keep supporting and we need to keep improving over time. Social protection policies, investments in social protection systems, have served as power instruments for strengthening people's access to nutritious food including during COVID-19 pandemic. Importantly, social protection is more than short-term response to acute situations of food insecurity and malnutrition. When predictable and well-targeted, and this is central, well-targeted, social protection can support households to engage in new economic activities and to capitalize on opportunities created by continued economic dynamism of the food systems. They will bring about the long-term improvements in access to healthy diets. We saw that social protection helped enormously to reduce the potential effects of extreme poverty. Although extreme poverty in many regions of the world increased enormously, social protection even helped to minimize those. So it will have been even worse. But one lesson learned also here is the importance of information. Because this type of shock was not the typical shock and not necessarily affected the same people. It affected also other people in peri-urban areas, for example. So having real-time information, like the fears, the food insecurity experience scale that FAO is collecting, help enormously to identify quickly where these social protection projects, should policies should also be targeting. So are the resources that we are using to minimize, to minimize the effects of these chokes could be optimal and be extremely effective and not wasted, especially in times of restricted resources. Among the medium term risk, however, and this is on the right side, Countries are still having difficulty in controlling the spread of COVID-19 due to emerging variants, both developed and developing countries. And this could lead to negative impacts on economic recovery linked to possible reintroduction of restrictions, prolongment of unemployment and food access issues. So slow and diverging paths of economic recovery are adding to the food access 
and food availability issues linked to climate change. So we need to be very careful. Food prices, as measured by the FAO Food Price Index, have been rising for a year, as I mentioned before. And while the index fell two consecutive months in June and July, it increased again in August. And this is linked to a supply problem because of weather. Moreover, food stocks today are not as high as they were at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's something that we need to look very carefully because it's essential to assure bigger resilience. But as well, we need to keep in mind that COVID-19 is just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, the pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities in our food systems as a result of major drivers such as conflict, climate variability and extremes, and economic slowdowns and downturns. These are increasingly occurring simultaneously in countries seriously undermining food security and nutrition. And when they complement shocks like conflict with recession or climate shocks with recession, the situation gets even worse. And that's what we need to try to minimize. As we mentioned before, with less than a decade to achieve the 2030, the world is not on track and not on path to ending world hunger and malnutrition. And in the case of world hunger, again, we are moving in the wrong direction. What we understood during this crisis is that once more, that during economic downturns, it is critical to keep food supply chains operational while providing adequate support to the livelihoods of the most vulnerable people, ensuring continued production and access to nutritious food. Just if we look at the map of the world and the number of group of commodities that countries need to be able to achieve access to healthy diets, the continents like Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, are the ones that face the biggest challenge. They have the lower number of group food groups that they need to achieve this. So trade today is essential and we need to use trade and we need to minimize barriers of trade. We need to facilitate trade and we need to optimize intergeneral trade. There is no way with the photograph we have today that we will be able to achieve the 2030 goal if we don't accelerate this process. In the case of COVID-19, as the full economic and social impacts of the pandemic are still unfolding, and as the disease is still spreading, there could still be severe implications for access to food and longer term shifts in global demand and supply of food and agricultural commodities. It is therefore of utmost importance that the countries and the international community as a whole continue supporting vulnerable groups in promoting access to food, ensuring open markets and uninterrupted trade flows and avoiding actions that can jeopardize the food security situation, particularly in developing countries dependent on food imports. Now, how can this be done? Different policies and actions can be considered. Countries can continue supporting the functioning of markets by further enhancing transparency and coordination, particularly as we may face tightening pressures on commodity markets and rising prices. It is imperative to refrain from ad hoc trade restriction measures. They can address policy barriers, for instance, related to food safety, including through widespread adoption of digital solutions in the application of SPS measures and on trade procedures regional markets offer a significant untapped potential in this area. We can accelerate interregional trade. And for that, SPS is central, and we need to use the state-of-the-art technologies for it. In many countries, boosting trade and accessing new markets also requires that significant investments are made in tracking the structural barriers to trade. Countries can therefore work to fix the physical constraints, such as undeveloped marketing and trade infrastructure. We need to come back to look at the value chain infrastructure and link them and link producers to dynamic markets. We need institutional innovations to link smallholders to markets, including the standards that are needed to be able to move commodities. Finally, countries need to keep providing support to promote access to nutritious foods, including through safety nets and enhanced social protection programs, as mentioned before, but well-targeted programs, where information is used to improve the targeting because the dynamics of the jobs are not always the same. Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure to be with you today. Maximo, Maximo thank you so much for such a comprehensive presentation, I would say, uh, presenting us the, the full picture on the impact, indeed, of COVID-19 on, on, on trade, as well as on the, the, the various responses that have been developed, and including the, the role of FAO in there. So uh, we have uh, already, I think, somebody uh, who has been asking for, for the floor, uh, Peter Lunenborg. So while we uh, upgrade him to, uh, to panelist and give him the opportunity to talk, I would like, of course, to uh, remind everybody now that the, the floor is open and, uh, and that 
uh, we will uh, basically uh, take a couple of questions uh, that you, uh, Maximo, uh, will be uh, aiming to respond, I believe. Uh, some, uh, we may go back to the, uh, I mean, if we have no time or if they are too technical, we may also have the po possibility to go back to some of the, of the, of the people for their, uh, um, I mean, to provide them with additional information. There are also a number of, of, uh, of comments that have been made in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, in the Q and A, actually, which which are quite interesting, and for example, uh, Maximo one from uh, Martin Fowler, uh, uh, referring to the uh, the fact that, of course, the the, the countries themselves have been uh, doing their own data collection analysis, and where he refers to the uh, the FAO policy briefs, and uh, you and your team, Maximo, have been very active in producing so many of these briefs. And it's, I think, good to see that they are that they are appreciated and that they are used uh, by the by the countries. Um, so uh, I would like now to give the floor to uh, Peter, and then we'll see how to uh, how to come back uh, to to you, Maximo. Peter Lunenborg, uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you so much for giving me the floor, and I I would like to thank FEO and Mr. Maximo uh, for his. Uh, uh, for his PPT. It is a very useful and a rich uh, presentation. Uh, I'm uh, Peter Lunenborg. I'm a senior program officer for, uh, in the Trade for Development program uh, here in Geneva uh, at the South Center. Um, so I just have a few uh, mainly technical questions uh, regarding the numbers that have been uh, presented. So, so the first question is, uh, what is generally the correlation between the FAO food price index and the price of agricultural imports? I mean, if, if there is a one-to-one -one correlation or it is time lags. So, so, so can we see a correlation between the food price index uh, and the price of agricultural imports? Staying within that, uh, there was a very interesting indicator presented which is food imports as, as a percentage of total marketized exports as indicator. And what is interesting, is there any research which indicate at which level can a country be considered to be vulnerable? I mean, is it 20%, is it 50%, if, if it's more than 100%, or are we talking more about increase in this indicator? So is it, is it, is it about the absolute uh, number of that indicator or it's more about the increase in that indicator? And then uh, the third question is about ending stocks. Uh, what I found interesting is that the ending stocks have been at a flat level, uh, just below 850 million tons during the last few years. Uh, is there any estimate or guesstimate uh, of the share between private and public health stocks? As you know, public stock holding has been uh, you know, a very contested issue here in Geneva, but it's very interesting to know whether there is a guesstimate or estimate how much of this 80, 850 is actually public and how much is, is private. And lastly, um, could you tell more about FEO research on the provision of agricultural subsidies during or on account of COVID-19? I mean, there is a whole process in WTO to increase an ad hoc process to increase transparency on this kind of subsidies. And it appears that several members actually have increased significantly the subsidies uh, on account or during uh, this, this pandemic time. So uh, these are four questions. Uh, so thank you for, for, for giving me the floor and for, for this discussion. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter. I don't see any other and raised, but there are, of course, the, the question of Peter, um, Maximo covers a number of, uh, of aspects, including, I think, the two issues that have been uh, raised also in the, in the Q&A on, um, on, domestic, on domestic stock and also on domestic uh, support program. So, uh, Maximo, do you want to, to come? Uh, yes, on, sure. On no no problem. Let, let, me, let me go. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please, Maximo, go ahead. Okay, so let me go first through the questions in the chat, and then I can go to, to the questions of, of Peter. Okay, so first, uh, Martin Fowler, completely agree. There has been enormous amounts of efforts uh, on many countries to improve the data that they collect. 
We tried to accelerate the process as soon as the pandemic started so that we can bring technical evidence and also because we have offices in 190 countries which allow us to collect local information and see what policies were put in place. So, but at the same time, we did technical work to try to show what were the potential impacts. So we thought that combination would be important. But one of the topics, as I mentioned in my presentation, that was central and where many that we couldn't find that level of information at the beginning was the logistical part, which in the case of this shock was central. No? The mobility of vessels, the blockages of ports, the blockages of roads, especially in key exporting countries. So that's something that we learn and we keep uh, improving. Regarding the question of uh, anonymous attendee on, on the perceived of public stock holding, and this is linked to the, one of the questions of Peter. Uh, so the, the, what we know today is the absolute level of stocks and stock to use ratio. It's very complex, as you well know, Peter, uh, to decompose what is private and what is public, because it's, it's still, AMIS have not been able uh, to separate and to identify the level of, of, of private stocks. Now, what we know on the other hand, which is something to, to open eyes, is that the biggest increase in the stocks has been because of China. That means that one country explains a significant amount of the increase in the stocks in the last years. And that's also opens a concern on vulnerability. No? Uh, so although stocks have been rising and although now they are, they are, stab they are stabilized, uh, the biggest share uh, of the increase was because of one country. And that's something that we need to explore. Now, in countries like China, it's impossible to know what is private and what is public because of the way they store and the mechanisms they have in place. The similar applies to, to other countries. But we are still doing efforts to try to link with the private sector and try to understand that. Of course, you can understand through analysis uh, what should be the level of stocks for the level of prices that you're observing and for the level of, uh, of mobility of goods. But that's not enough. No, We need to have more information on that, and that's where we are, where we are working. Then there was a question for Facundo Calvo. Could you elaborate further on the consequences of domestic support programs adopted during the COVID-19? And I think that was also linked to your subsidies questions to agriculture, uh, Eric, that, that you, Peter, that you did. So we are tracking this. We are tracking the changes. We just finished a report on, on subsidies to agriculture and repurposing of subsidies together with other UN agencies. The problem here is which are, these, which are subsidies and, and support mechanisms which are distortive to markets? It's important to understand which are creating distortions and how we can phase them out. Because those are the problems. Those are that goes against the market flowing, goes against trade. And that's the whole role. And what we have seen is that there is significant area or space to repurpose those subsidies. Now, the complexity is how you repurpose them, not how you move subsidies which are distortive and phase them out by showing and bringing evidence that they are distortive and repurpose them to activities which could be more uh, creating better benefits like research and development in agriculture. Why is problematic? Because of the time dimension. As I mentioned before, some of the policies put by countries was to support the local consumers. And if they are temporal, that should be okay because they are solving a bigger problem, which is local consumption. But if they remain over time, that's when the distortion becomes problematic. And that's where we need to find ways and bring evidence to show that that shouldn't be the case and what we can do to, to improve over that. In terms of the correlation between the, the FAO food price index, it's important to understand the composition of the FAO food price index, and we can share you the details on that. It's in the webpage, it's open, but it's important to understand because not necessarily you will expect a correlation one to one because you're not capturing one commodity. You're capturing baskets of commodities and build indexes based on that. But for sure, there is a correlation between it, which explains why in some cases the import bills has increased because of an increase in the prices of those commodities. But we don't only track the FAO food price index, we also track individual commodity price indices, which help us to understand better what is going on. And we are also tracking very closely volatility and excessive volatility, which also helps enormously because it's not only an issue of prices going up, the issue is also when you have excessive volatility, means extreme values of volatility, like low probability of occurrence, 5% of probability. In those cases, this really affects the market because it's not just an issue of liquidity, it's an issue that makes allows, doesn't allow farmers to make optimal decisions because they don't know where the price will go. They have a very low probability of certainty. And that's what we also need to track uh, very closely. In terms of the food imports uh, index that you referred to, uh, these are absolute va values, okay? And, and what we, and they are not done to measure a threshold of when we are more vulnerable or not. What we're doing for that is we have developed as, as a result of the SOFA that will be published in October, the state of food and agriculture, we have developed a resilience index, four indicators of resilience, to try to capture how and what are the thresholds where your resilience is low. 
The two indicators, one of them is looking at capacity to be able to improve or import or, or have the availability of production that you need to satisfy the needs of your population. And that includes, of course, capacity to produce locally and capacity to export. And the other one is looking at the capacity to be able to have access to what is needed for healthy diets, which also includes imports, exports, of course, and production. Those indices are telling us, and, and we, can, we will share it soon, how vulnerable you are and what level of resilience you have. And that's where the policies will need to do to improve. We also have another index that looks at transportation and the transportation network to try to understand the logistical part, which now we come to know how important it is. And the last index, the fourth part, is looking at what will happen if there is an economic shock and a recession and how much buffer that economy has to be able to react to that. And that is linked to the social cash transfer programs that I was mentioning before. Because again, tell us how much you are ready to be able to cope with that, with, with that, with that risk. So I stop that there, Dominic. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maximo. Uh, I don't see any other uh, person participant asking for the floor. So uh, I think perhaps we can leave it there therefore for, for today. And uh, we will make sure indeed that uh, everybody gets the um, the material we'll share with all registered participants the, the PowerPoint presentation. The, 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 the PowerPoint is uh, also, the, the meeting itself is of course also uh, being uh, recorded. So you will have the opportunity to, uh, to, to see it. But uh, before concluding, I would like to say that of course we are committed to have this uh, uh, FAO Geneva Agricultural uh, Trade Talks uh, continuing, and we'd like therefore to invite you to to send us here in our office in Geneva all suggestions uh, you may have in an interest you may have in terms of uh, of future discussions. Uh, I think that a lot of them will uh, will revolve uh, around the the policy briefs. There are more policy briefs that are. Uh, being prepared, including a number of them uh, in relation to the forthcoming MC12. Uh, they are, uh, and, and I think these can trigger very useful information. There is also a huge volume of information uh, that is uh, gathered by Maximo and his team in headquarters, and that will indeed feed into these, uh, these conversations. So uh, with that, I would like again to thank uh, first of all, Maximo uh, and his team for participating in uh, in today's conversation, and uh, and you all participants for for attending and making this as a as a rich uh, event. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.